I've always loved science. Since I was a child, I've been fascinated by understanding what things are made of and motivated by curiosity to find out for myself. Children are naturally curious. Investing in this instinct is the best training for scientists to make breakthroughs that have the potential to help us live better, healthier, and more fulfilling lives. It's interesting and noble work and it was the prospect of becoming a scientist that led me to study maths, physics, and chemistry at school. But after that, as a woman, that's where I became a bit unusual because I went on to study chemistry at university. All children study science to some level at school, but when it comes to studying the sciences in higher education, the proportion of young women drops dramatically. We're working hard to address that at the Science Museum Group. But what else can be done to increase gender equality in science, technology, engineering and mathematics, the STEM subjects? What we need to do is show them role models of girls like them, personality like them, friendly, outgoing, bubbly, creative, and show actually women like that do, just like them, do really well in science, technology and engineering, are happy, find something they're interested in, excited by to break down those stereotypes to show them people just like them actually uh, do thrive in these industries. The history of science is littered with intrepid endeavors and amazing discoveries. Most of the best known made by men. But a handful of female names stick in my mind. People like Ada Lovelace, the 19th century mathematician who worked on a mechanical general purpose computer. Valentina Tereshkova, the first woman in space, who remains the only one ever to complete a solo mission. Amy Johnson, the first female pilot to fly a plane solo from Britain to Australia. And British Nobel Prize winning chemist Dorothy Hodgkin, whose discoveries remain critical to modern medicine and our scientific understanding. Recently, we've seen the opportunities and support for today's women in science grow and the chances to establish long and successful careers increase. We need to build on that. We find that there are still much fewer women at the higher levels of an academic research career. Um, and this is, I think, because so many have taken a break. And that break can be for family reasons, it can be for caring, it can be for health, or relocation indeed with a, with a partner. Um, but what a lot of people don't realise is that there is a way back in. Initiatives like the government's Year of Engineering and this, the Science Museum's Engineer Your Future Gallery, show that women are contributing to and leading some of the most important scientific and technical advances today. But we can and must do more to show girls and women that science truly is for them. Well, I'm delighted to say that Dame Mary joins me now alongside Professor Averill MacDonald of Southampton University, who's the diversity lead at the Southeast Physics Network, and an old friend of the programme, Edwina Dunn. She's founder of Female Lead and the founder of Dunn Humby, the company behind worldwide loyalty programmes such as Tesco's Club Cars. And also with us live from Westminster is the Science Minister, Sam Gema. Mary, let me start with you. This is not a new problem. Why are we making such slow progress? Well, we are making some progress. Um, numbers are up in general, though there is a big black hole on physics. Why? I don't know. I think there are deep-seated cultural differences about bringing up girls and bringing up boys. Um, also, stereotypes of scientists and science can be way behind reality, and people have no idea of the diversity of careers that are open to them if they keep up their STEM and close to them if they don't. Avril, there's been some really interesting research done on participation rates at school and immediately afterwards. It's physics and maths in particular, though. STEM isn't the right, necessarily the right uh, category here, is it? Absolutely. If we look at STEM overall, actually girls are increasing participation, and even in maths, they're way above 40% at A level and degree level, so there's an awful lot of progress. But stubbornly, physics has remained at about 20% of those taking A level of are female and 20% at degree level are female. And that's despite, since the 1980s, now nearly 40 years of effort 
on our part, we have not made any progress. Something fundamentally is going wrong. And it's not as if, though, girls are avoiding so-called hard subjects. If you take things like veterinary science, medical science at university, women are way in the uh, ascendance in Absolutely. those subjects. Absolutely. Sixty-five percent of medical students are female now, so they're certainly not avoiding the hard subjects. And it is something that's peculiar to the UK. If you look across Europe, we are the worst in a long way behind all of the other countries in terms of the number of women in STEM careers. It's what we do that is the problem. So somewhere along the line, it looks as though we are reinforcing gender stereotypes here in the UK about these subjects. I think so. I mean, you know, girls need to see role models that they believe they can be one day so you know we have this saying you can't be what you can't see so we're trying to take the female lead with its 60 amazing role models into we're now in 3,000 schools in the UK and girls teachers parents are beginning to talk to us and saying it's wonderful we now can see that there are lots of ways of having a career that's both feminine and exciting and successful. Are the right models, role models out there? Though? I mean, are some of them a bit intimidating, maybe. That's very true. Um, but the the thing about diversity, the thing about having sixty very very different women, is girls can pick the one that they relate to. So we have one um, very very popular. Um, woman who is a ballerina. She's absolutely um, incredible, Michaela de Prince. And, you know, so many girls want to be a ballerina or a princess when they're young. Um, she's just happened to be the prima ballerina in the Royal Dutch Ballet and has come a very, very long way and so shows a different type of success. All right, well, Sam Jima, let me bring you in at this point. You, you... You've become university's minister relatively recently. Have, have you formed a diagnosis in your own mind as to how to tackle this issue yet? Well, well the, the, the first point I, I will say about this is um, when it comes to innovation, when it comes to breakthroughs, it's scientists and people in engineering and maths that are at the forefront of it. So as a country and as a society, we need a lot more people doing this. And it's not an issue of fairness, but actually getting talented women through is actually good for our economy and good for our country. In terms of what I'm seeing is I think what you need is you need a sustainable pipeline of talent. But although we've seen an increase in the number of girls taking science related subjects, at every stage of the process you have leakage. So even if I look at apprenticeships, it is national apprenticeship this week after all, the number of women in STEM-related apprenticeships is something like 11% according to some independent research. The number of women who qualify in STEM degrees but then go on to have a STEM career is something like 24%. So I haven't got a diagnosis per se, but what I do know is that the industrial strategy that the government is pursuing has very much at its heart getting the right talent to help solve the challenges that we face in our country and in the world today. But, I mean, is there anything wrong with the way some of these subjects are being taught at universities? You've just mentioned the dropout rates there, for example. I mean, are you going to be cracking the whip on certain vice-chancellors? Well, I, I think it's, um, there are many different reasons, and I, I think uh, it's Mary who talked about some of the deep-seated cultural reasons around subject choice, but also how careers in science operate. So if you want to work in science, the nature of the contracts, are the contracts structured in such a way that if you wanted to take time out of work for, uh, to have children, they can easily come back? You know, the emphasis on research and research citations, how does that actually help support uh, women scientists in their careers? There are lots of different things, and I think it will take a concerted effort, you're right, at university level, research councils, but also from employers to make sure that we do not have what in America they call the Los Einsteins, the really talented people who could help solve great problems for us who just don't make it. All right, Sam, I'm going to ask uh, Averill to put a question to you directly now. Averill, fire I'm very away. keen to make sure we don't have the lost Einsteins, but I'm very aware that we have a system in the UK that could well be losing a lot of them, not just girls, but children from ethnic minority groups as well. And that's the fact that they have to make a choice at 14 or so to take triple award, three separate sciences, or double award, a combined science. 
Now, schools are now rationing access to that triple award, the separate sciences, which tends to be the springboard to A-level, because they can't afford more than one set. And an awful lot of the kids who are not allowed to take the triple are from ethnic minority groups, disproportionately, and girls. That means a lot of lost scientists are being prevented from going to A-level because the school can't afford to get them into the right classes at the age of 14. Now, are we aware of a way of getting around this? Because I would suggest just getting rid of triple awards so that no child is disadvantaged at 14 and they all get to 16 with exactly the same opportunities and then that discrimination wouldn't happen. I'd be interested in your view on that. Well, no, this is a, quite a well-rehearsed argument, sort of uh, triple science versus uh, double science. I, I think w w what, is, what is important throughout the school system is making sure that everyone understands the rules of the game. And as you say, some well-off uh, children understand the rules of the game much sooner and know that if I want to keep my options open, I should go down this path. And things like the careers and enterprise company that the government set up, which is going into schools to stimulate people's interests, to raise aspirations, are all things that are they're very useful in making uh, children understand from very early age what is out there, but also what one needs to do to re um, realize your aspirations, if your aspirations lie in that field. I wouldn't say that somehow our education system systematically makes it difficult for uh, children from ethnic minority backgrounds, but I think more needs to be done in terms of letting them know what the rules of the game are. Mary, what do you make of what you've just heard? Very interesting, and I, I would hesitate to do away with the triple award, I must say, because, you know, there's a lot to learn in science, and you, you might as well do away with English la language or English literature, if you see what I mean. You, you've got to allow some specialisation. Anyway, I'm not <laughs> meant to be arguing with my <laughs> co panelists I'm meant to be addressing you, Minister. So um, I guess my question is about the role of informal learning in science. So in the Science Museum group, we have two million children come with their mums and their dads or their school teachers um, every year. A tremendous opportunity for us to light that spark. Um, but, of course, really, to get qualified in science, you've got to do some formal education. What do you think the role of Mary, informal is? I'm, I'm afraid we're going to have to leave that question hanging in the air because we're out of time, I'm afraid. Right. <laughs> Mary, Mary Osher, Avril MacDonald, Edwina Dunn and Sam Jima in Westminster. Thanks very much, all.